You know, as parents, I think it's very clear that there is something wrong with society <clears throat> and our kids and the amount of stimulation they have, the devices, social media, the overscheduling. Like, I think we know that there is something that's gone wrong here, but I think a lot of times parents don't have a clear picture of what it is or even what to do about it. <clears throat> and that's why this conversation with Kim John Payne is one of the most important ones that I've done so far in the Mental Health Warriors podcast. I think without a doubt, that's the case. I had the, the privilege of seeing him speak a few weeks ago in, in London here, and it was just absolutely amazing. I had to leave early, unfortunately, but from what I saw in my wife's uh, report afterwards, it was just outstanding, the talk that he gave. And he told so many interesting stories, but really shared a message of a different style of parenting, a style of parenting that kind of goes back to where we were and talks about all the benefits that can come from that. You know, our children are not only overstimulated, but they are dealing a lot of times with, you know, sort of a low-grade trauma from the constant stress and stimulation and even the addiction of social media. All kinds of things um, are happening to them. And as parents... Our job is to understand that and then make informed choices about what to do about it. So Kim has authored a very famous book and created an incredible community of hundreds of thousands of people around the idea of simplicity parenting. He's written many other books, but this is one of the ones we primarily talk about in this inter, uh, in the, this podcast conversation. And he's really got four pillars of, of simplicity parenting that he talks about uh, at length in the podcast. The first is to declutter the home environment. The second is to increase predictability and rhythms of connection and calm. Three is to uh, soothing schedules. And four is unplugging from media consumerism and adult concerns. And it's uh, really a wonderful conversation. So who is Kim? He is, as I said, the author of the number one best-selling book, Simplicity Parenting. He's a consultant and trainer to more than 200 North American independent and public schools. And he's been a school counselor, adult educator, consultant, researcher, educator, and private family counselor for 27 years. This guy travels all over the world um, giving talks, workshops, conferences, and is really creating something special. And I know in our life, in the Waldorf community, so our kids, uh, one daughter, Melody, still goes to Waldorf, and our older daughter, Chloe, did go there until this year. She graduated. But within the Waldorf community, the the, the pillars of, of simplicity parenting are, parenting are taken very seriously. And I can say uh, from having witnessed these principles in action, they, they really work. And there is so much more in that can be found in less. So please listen to this conversation because not only will you take away a different view of parenting and how to interact with your kids and how to prepare them to function effectively in the world. But you'll hear Kim talk about a number of different ways in which we can make choices to look at the world more compassionately. And there's a couple examples in there that I, in this conversation that I never, ever thought of. And I thank Kim for bringing it to me uh, and to the audience, because I think it, I know it opened my eyes and I think it'll open yours. Because when we look at the world from a, a more compassionate or through a more compassionate lens, it really changes how we interact with the world. It changes what we choose to see, and it allows us to more deeply connect with people who need our help and, you know, be in a position to offer that help. So I've just, I'm becoming such a fan of compassion and a student of learning how to incorporate it into my own life and then teaching my audience and my friends and the people that I coach and the people that I come into contact with uh, methods to incorporate it into yours. So enjoy this podcast. Thank you to Kim for this incredible, inc incredible conversation. I will, I am forever a changed person as a result of having had it. And I hope the same holds true for you as you listen to it. So enjoy. I'm constantly racking my brain thinking, okay, how do I add more value to people above and beyond the already awesome conversations that we're having in the Mental Health Warriors podcast. And that's why I've launched a Patreon page. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com and slash mental health warriors. Patreon.com slash mental health warriors. So what is Patreon? Patreon is this amazing platform where people can make a direct contribution to those that are creating content that they love. 
And I know you love the Mental Health Warriors podcast because you're listening to it and you're spreading the word. But I also know that you support the Mental Health Warriors mission, which is to assemble the most diverse and complete set of perspectives on emotional and mental healing and well-being anywhere on the internet, period. And I will not stop until we accomplish that goal together. But starting and and running a movement or building a movement and running a podcast is not free and it's not cheap. There are all kinds of costs, graphic design costs, there's web hosting costs and web development costs and podcast editing costs and podcast hosting costs and calendaring, like scheduling costs. And it all adds up, right? And I need the Mental Health Warriors movement to not only be self-sustaining, but I need to grow it because the amount of people that we can help is just almost limitless. And I've seen how many lives we've touched already. Okay, but I'm not asking you to make a donation. I am telling you that I am offering you a value exchange. And what that means is in support or in return for your financial contribution to the Mental Health Warriors podcast and movement, I will offer you rewards that are super, super valuable and super impactful in your life. Okay, like you will be shocked at what I offer you in exchange for your financial contribution. So please head on over to patreon.com slash mental health warriors, support the show and let me make a contribution back to you in return for your contribution to supporting the movement. It's such a beautiful, virtuous cycle. And I would love for you to be part of it. And I just I can't thank you enough for your continued support of what we're trying to do here, because every single person listening to this show has someone in their life that can benefit from what we are doing at Mental Health Warriors, and I want to be able to reach them. And if you want to also support the show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a a review and uh, a rating because that helps us get uh, surface higher in the search results. It helps more people reach our podcast. It literally takes you two minutes to do that, and it will help us spread our message. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for listening. And thanking you, thank you for helping me make a difference in people's lives. If you're a high performer who craves deeper human connection and you want to develop powerful relationships to help you achieve personal and professional excellence and you're sick and tired of feeling isolated and alone, then my new coaching program, Serving Powerfully, is for you. I will show you how to become more open and more powerful so you can create those human connections that allow you to see, execute on, and realize an entirely different caliber of opportunities. You will walk out of our time together with a vastly increased ability to serve other people more powerfully. It's amazing how far you can go when someone believes in you. So if this sounds like you, please let's set up a time to have a powerful conversation. Email me at jason at servingpowerfully.com and let's get started. Warriors are not born. Warriors are forged in the crucible of adversity. Warriors without fear are warriors without courage. We are men destroying stigma and stereotypes. We are a band of brothers because in brotherhood there is strength. Our weapons are strength, empathy, and honesty. We are Mental Health Warriors and this is our voice. Kim, welcome to the Mental Health Warriors podcast. Oh, it's nice to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. You know, it's funny. You're very welcome. I feel like I'm talking to uh, like a rock star in the circles that I travel in because in the Waldorf community, um, you're uh, you're legend. So uh, I had the chance to see you speak uh, was it last week. It seems like a while ago, but I think it was actually only last week. And uh, you lived up to the hype. So I'm looking forward to getting into your message and why simplicity parenting is so important to you. Yeah, yeah, that that's a, I mean that's a really super important theme. So I'm glad we got time to talk about that today. Sure. 
So how did you, I mean, how did you stumble across the idea of simplicity parenting? And I ask that because I feel like a lot of parents know that there's something is not working. I mean, I think we can see the evidence all around us that, you know, there's something wrong. Our kids are increasingly dealing with mental health issues and they have, you know, trouble paying attention and their, you know, their education is suffering and there's lots of social anxiety, but I don't think they, they know maybe what it is, or sometimes maybe can't see the forest through the trees, but you were able to do that. So can you talk to me about how you came to the conclusion that we needed to do something different and then, you know, developed simplicity parenting as a result? Yeah, you know, it was really interesting, Jason, because uh, it began for me way back when I was in college, actually, and I was um, living in a group home for troubled teenagers. And um, I was attending college uh, in the daytime, working in this place in the evening, or actually living in um, as well. And I had a professor who was a, um, he was a doctor a medic actually in the second world war then trained as a doctor an md and uh, attended in the korean war and then the vietnam war so he had these lot of experiences and he talked about what was then emerging the the term that um, back then in the late 70s was trauma response ptsd that i uh, hadn't yet uh, that term hadn't yet emerged and uh, he was talking about nervous, jumpy, hypervigilant. He was talking about um, uh, uh, anarchic patterns of behavior, you know, obsessive, anarchic, over-controlling behavior, um, night terrors. And he was, as he was going through his list of, of, of um, presentations of symptoms of tra then trauma response uh, for combat veterans that were really struggling, I was putting that directly together with the kids in the group home. And uh, because it was striking the similarities between what the symptoms he was describing and the kids that I was working with. So I approached him and um, said, look, these kids aren't combat veterans. What's, this is a real puzzle. Um, could they have this trauma response? And he gave me this classic sort of academic answer. He said, well, it's not impossible, but there's no <laughs> empirical data, right? So mm -hmm. um, I invited him to the group home and he was very kind to come. He was a well-known character. And I was so pleased when he agreed to, to, to come to the home and he became a little bit of a, a, of a frequent visitor. Every couple of weeks he'd pop in, the kids called him Dr. Dude, <laughs> and, <laughs> and they liked him a lot. He was a very kind, gentle man. He'd seen a lot in his life. And so I stayed in touch with him very closely as we tried to figure out this puzzle, like why were these kids suffering from very, very similar symptoms, like remarkably similar to combat veterans? And so that was, that was uh, you know, they'd been through a kind of a war in their lives, and that, that thread that thread really stayed with me over the years because then what happened is I finished my uh, studies and decided to travel and volunteer in various uh, places, real hot spots in Southeast Asia, which back then Southeast Asia was like the Middle East is now, unfortunately. And so I volunteered uh, in Indonesia, in various refugee camps, uh, in um, kampongs, you know, like uh, slums, I guess we call them. Um, and then up to the Thai Cambodian refugee camps at the time of the Pol Pot regime, just in, in the aftermath of the Vietnam War. And there again, I saw nervous, jumpy, hypervigilant, over-controlling, night terror. I saw all the same behavior. And, you know, most, I mean, you could probably get your mind around it. Most of the listeners uh we could get our minds around this because these kids were coming from war. You know, they were, they were fleeing war, very dislocated, but they still, they were not combat veterans. And the diagnosis was, was now starting to emerge more and more as the years went on, strictly limited to combat veterans. And it wasn't to other populations. Then the final step uh, in, in this journey for me was after I left um, Southeast Asia, 
and, and decided to come and do more postgraduate study. So I went to London in the UK and there um, I started really digging into it. I, I really wanted to understand this. So I was going to school during the day studying, but at, uh, uh, but at nighttime, evenings and nighttime, I had my own private counseling practice. And through the door came nervous, jumpy, hypervigilant, over-controlling, um, anarchic. These kids from from different economic backgrounds, different racial backgrounds, um, they all they looked like wartime kids. They they it was it was almost too big a thought to let in. I, I just couldn't really. Mm. I thought, hang on a minute, this is. If I let this, if I really look at this, um, I, you know, this is too much because these are normal kids. I want to, I was studying war and trauma, right? So I was studying that, but through the door every late afternoon, evening would come kids who looked like they were coming from war. And so I thought, you know what it is? It's just because I'm a, you know, any psych grad will tell you that they they are always we're always second guessing each other right and we, we you know when you study you think you just about have every syndrome that you study so you know i thought okay i've got a hammer everything's a nail this can't be right it just can't be right but i was visited by two of my colleagues from the refugee camps in asia who were back they were from denmark and they came to visit me and they saw exactly the same thing and so I had my mini little heads up or control group, like that they were saying, wow, and we've noticed the same thing. So at the time, and this is the end of this, of, of this sort of to answer this, this, this question, um, at the time, a lot of brain imaging uh, was starting to become available for um, non-medical purposes, for research purposes. And it was starting to emerge that there could be um, the amygdala, the, the, the ancient reptilian brain, did have a memory. It did have a trauma memory, um, and that was emerging a, as new science at the time. And also my thought was, well, could this be cumulative? Could this memory be uh, caused by medium to low-grade unrelenting stress as opposed to high-velocity really <clears throat> off the chart stress of a combat uh, veteran and I became more and more convinced and the, and certainly the, the 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 empirical evidence was starting to point in that direction so my research really went in that direction and really what was the birth of the simplicity parenting movement actually began with me doing something that I back then called um, a moderate grade stress audit and I invented this audit um, so that I could speak with the parents, go through the stressors in their lives, grade that alongside what combat veterans were experiencing, and then um, basically meet with the parents and say, look, let's do what we can to reduce the stress levels. And they, they sort of looked at me and said, well, yeah, but we're not living life that is any more unusual than anyone else. And that was, that was the turning point because these kids were from relatively typical backgrounds. And so it set me thinking, this is cumulative stress reaction. It was a term that back then I invented just for myself. This is a cumulative stress reaction, which can build up over time and cause a tremendous amount of, of, of problems. But you see, the big problem with all this was that this level of stress had become the new normal. It had become ubiquitous. And so it, it's very difficult to call it when that's happening because it, it, it's become so commonly accepted. But, we, but I did, with, the, with the, the, the wonderful families I was working with, uh, we did reduce stress and wherever we could whatever was doable. And we noticed a remarkable change in the children's behavior and a, a wonderful connection back with their, with their parents. And the parents would say things like, I, I feel like I've got my little boy back. 
I feel like I've got my teenage girl back. They're back. And I, and I just took it for granted that they had to do all that stuff. And so then over the years, I started collecting up what that stuff was. We're like, what was, what, what is, what are they actual high grade, moderate grade stressors? And that became the backbone of, of um, these four pillars of simplicity that I write about in the Simplicity Parenting book. So the actual birth of this, Jason, was, was through a biographical journey, as most, you know, as most things are. And that's what led to this now, you know, um, one of the largest worldwide parenting movements. Wow, what a great story. One thing I'm curious about is, what was it that called you to do the work you were doing in Southeast Asia at the time? All my family, going back uh, four generations, actually, had myself as the fourth, so three generations, uh, had been involved in, in as combat veterans. My, my great-grandfather, grandfather, father, uncles, great-uncles, had all fought in the various wars, the Boer War, the First World War, Second World War, Vietnam War. And um, I saw, you see, one of the things that this um, professor back when I was studying gave me a heads up on is that he, was de- he described trauma response, what we now know as PTSD. But growing up in small town Australia, as I did, I, the way he was describing these men I thought was just malehood. That was every man in my town. That that was. I just thought that's what they were like. Um, they would. They were. They were hard scrabble guys. Fights would break out. They had like emotional hair triggers. Kind, caring, very emotional at times. Um, would ping pong back between being extremely emotional and then extremely locked down. Um, I saw all that, particularly on the sports fields, in and around uh, the hotels, the pubs, and so on. It was rough. And, but I just thought that's what men were like. I didn't realize until in my 20s when I was studying this that there was a whole generation of trauma-affected um, uh, uh, men in my town. Fortunately, my own father wasn't like that. He was very kind, very caring, very balanced. He was someone who had been in the army, but had somehow got through it um, intact. Well, in you know, he did well. But what caused me to want to work in those sites was I wanted to do my bit, as we say in Australia, but I didn't want to be shooting at anyone. Um, but I did want to do what I could for the people that had been affected by the shooting and the bombing. And, and so that was my rationale is that I, you know, I came from this background, but I would do it my own way. Okay. So that's fascinating. One thing I'm really interested in is as you look into a subject like this, as a researcher, you know, I, I assume, correct me if I'm wrong, but I assume that one of the things that, that would be part of your research is understanding how we went from where we were, so say a simpler time or whatever, to where we are right now, uh, to, so you can understand sort of the genesis of this, of this situation. As a researcher, especially on a subject like this that is so like politically and socially charged, how do you do the research in as objective a way as possible because especially on this subject i mean you could have people like say on the you know saying it's the destruction of the family it's women in the workforce it's the taxes are too high like it's a very the state of our our families is a very charged topic so how do you cut through that as a researcher to try to get to the truth the best you can it's a little bit like the um now almost cliched metaphor of the frog in the beaker right um if you put a, a frog um, in a, a, a beaker of, of water and slowly heat it, very slowly, and just heat it over time and keep heating it. As the minutes go by, you keep heating it. The frog won't attempt to jump out, even though the temperature has got to a critical uh, level and is starting to, to, to uh, threaten you know, the, 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 the health of the frog. 
if you were to take another frog and drop it in a beaker of exactly that water, that temperature water at critical level, it would flail and try and jump out. And I'm not suggesting, by the way, anyone does this, of course. <laughs> don't try this at home, folks. But the No animals were harmed in the making of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, 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 the frog... And this is actually, people have actually done this, but it's, um, we say we don't need to do it anymore, but the, the frog would um, be, you know, panicked. So what I'm suggesting is that society is heated up over the pace of life is heated up over a long period of time. Really, you know, you'd have to go back two or three generations. You, you go back to um, the depression and, um, the economic depression of the 30s. That was certainly where my thoughts uh, go to. Something was triggered then, something that was triggered that was very primal, which was, you know, we have to, like a, a survival, a mass survival instinct, because before that, uh, survival had been on a uh, a, 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 a town by town, small scale warfare by warfare. And what we saw in the First World War and then into the economic depression was, was a, a, a mass global uh, uh, threaten, threatened, um, uh, threatening to our, actually, to our survival. And, I, and my thoughts have often gone back to that place because like, like many of us, I had um, relatives, my grandfather and father went through the First World War, and then my father, the, the Depression and the Second World War. And we had, I think we had a lot of triggering um, at that stage. A lot of survival behavior began at that stage. But to to answer your question more specifically, um, there is, there's a ton of research out there sh showing, uh, particularly now with the brain science, showing the the effects on on the, on a, a, neuro, a, a whole neurological system, and but the where I go to with this, I went to the the real practical. Frankly, I I decided to not so much go the strict academic route. I was very grateful for those who did, and I leaned heavily into their research. But for me, it was working directly with families. For ex I'll give you an example. Uh, a colleague, Bonnie River, and myself did a pilot study into ADHD. And what we did is we um, took about just over 50, I think it was 52 uh, children who were diagnosed with ADHD, both inattentive and hyperactive type on uh, Russell Barkley's scale. Here in the United States, that's a pretty accepted scale. And um, we uh, admitted them to this study and we uh, provided they were not using methylphenidate, you know, like Ritalin, Adderall and, and the likes. They were all above the 92nd percentile, pretty seriously hyperactive and inattentive. And they were all aged uh, between uh, 8 and 12 years of age. And we put them through a basically, long story short, a simplicity protocol, a, a balancing their lives, dialing back the stress, doing whatever we could to uh, both at school. We had some, some. We had one group of kids with um, fairly heavy protocols at school, reducing stress levels. And then we had another group. Um, well, when I say groups, actually, we controlled for this. We could track these kids because of journals, the parents' journals, the teachers' journals, and we could find what areas uh, were particularly being simplified and, and balanced in their lives. And after four months of the study, or three, three months, three weeks of the study, 68% um, of the kids that adhered closely to the protocols <laughs> We had a red line there, and the kids that came above, who were closely to the protocols, went from clinically dysfunctional to functional, below the 71st percentile. That was Truex's. Any, any academic would probably recognize Barclay and Truex, these two names. Um, and uh, they were now functional. They had dropped below the 71st percentile. Now, this is this is a, this is um, we had to we had to go back our um, our, our uh, the people at UMass, the University of Massachusetts who are helping us with the study said that is way too big a, um, a a change you need to go back and do you know really check this do the data again they supervised us and sure enough it was pretty it was dead accurate sixty eight percent of kids 
now, as many mental health professionals know, that's not meant to happen. You know, you, you, you ADHD is hardwired. It's uh, it, you don't go in in three three months, three weeks from being dysfunctional to functional without there being chemical, uh, you know, some kind of change in brain chemistry, some t- some kind of medication given. Um, what we did is we didn't do that. We didn't go in that direction at all. We went just in. We went to just uh, lifestyle, environmental changes, and what? Um, and we also noticed a th- just over thirty-two percent jump in um, cognitive. In basically, we tested for um, uh, um, academics before. And then we had test, tested after, and the kids had jumped one and a half grade levels, for example, in their reading. Now, there's been so many studies, but particularly the study, if anyone's interested, particularly the learning habits study done more recently, learning habits. That really does, for me, that was the closest proper study because ours was really a pilot. Um, this was a very, I think it was 55,000 kids over 15 years were studied. And they found, you know, all kinds of direct correlates between stress levels um, on various on various levels of the causes of stress and the effects on the the uh, limbic system and frontal lobes in the brain. That study is very seminal. I think we really got that was a watershed study. But in a nutshell, I guess what and and we wrote about this when we when we um, published our. our the, the, the results from our little pilot study. Although 55 kids is that's that's it's a quant qual thing. That that's that's you know good enough to be able to have indicators, but I don't think it's good enough to come up with you know real really absolute statements. But what I you know what I found in this and, and I wrote about this is a couple of things, Jason. One is that I could no longer call it ADHD I just or ADD because it, what I discovered was that it's not a deficit. It's actually an excess of attention. It's not a deficit. It's almost silly to call it a deficit. But what I went one step further, myself and my colleague, Bonnie River, is that we um, suggested a shift in terminology to attention priority issues. Because these children, their attention was just fine, only it was misprioritized. So they would um, be asked to be paying attention to one thing at school, for example, um, where they were thinking about the kickball game at recess. And they would get a little locked down into that secondary or tertiary uh, tertiary um, uh, attention, whereas their first attention should have been on whatever they were studying you know, a long division or something in fourth grade. And so what I've done for years now is te- is coached teachers to be able to not see it as a deficit, but to be able actually to go with a child and ask them where their attention is right now and um, bring their attention to their attention and then reprioritize it gently, just going with it with the child saying, oh, so that's where your attention is? Okay, so what are you thinking about that? And they might say, well, I'm, I'm, I don't know what team I'll be in, and I'm really thinking about what team, and I'd like to play on Jason's team because he's, like, he's, he's really fast. <laughs> and you hear the child out and then draw their attention back to what, whatever's going on. And in that way, uh, very good things happen for a child. That's one of many strategies um, that can bring a child back. But more importantly than that, one of the things over the years, as I extended this thinking out, it basically became for me a very simple thought, not complicated at all. And it's this, that every child has their quirks that makes them lovable and kind of infuriating right at the same time you know they all every human being every child has a quirk but if you add cumulative stress to that quirk the unrelenting low grade f- supersized family life being a key one if you add cumulative stress to that child's life that quirk will become inflamed 
and become a problem and even a disorder. If you take that quirk and you give a child space for childhood and you, you help them lead a simple and balanced life, that quirk will become their gift. So the very same thing that can become a gift can be a disorder. And the way in which we live is a very strong determinant as to which direction it goes. Wow, that is something to think about. So first of all, I want to, in the interest of full disclosure for the audience, not one time ever did anybody ever say they wanted to be on my team because I was fast. Okay, so I want to put that out there. Uh, quite quite the opposite, in fact. <clears throat> but um, that, it, that's a really powerful thing to think about, the, the idea that something that could become somebody's greatest gift uh, also has the potential to become you know, something that really, really holds them back or becomes quite destructive. One thing I'm curious about is, like, I talk to a lot of men who, who have experienced, say, a pretty acute trauma in their childhood, so sexual abuse, physical abuse. And what's interesting is that so often what happens to them, so I'll do a coaching call with them, for example, and they'll say, they'll be telling me about how, you know, I'm not good enough, uh, I feel anxious, I feel depressed, I'm not, I don't measure up as a husband, I'm a terrible father, I, I suck at work, and blah, blah, blah. And so I always say... Tell me, tell me what happened to you. That's always the first question I ask. And inevitably, there's some kind of story where there's some trauma. But what's interesting is that, you know, highly intelligent men oftentimes are not able, sometimes they're, they're unwilling, but a lot of times they're not, they, they hadn't really considered the connection between what happened to them then and what's they're feeling now that this this trauma was a thread that runs through their their whole life and and that's when the trauma is really acute so this what's interesting about the like this low to medium grade trauma cumulative over time like when you talk to parents about it do they sit because i'm assuming many parents are like completely oblivious to the fact that there's a connection between their environment and their kids behavior in this way do many of them like is it like a light bulb going on or are many of them like do they find it really hard to believe you know, 20 years ago, um, it was more of a light bulb situation or a, you know, oh, that guy is just a little bit out there, mm. you know. But now, mm -mm, now it's almost like pointing this out is giving voice to a parental instinct. <clears throat> it's, it's no longer counterculture to many, many parents. And it's really interesting, Jason, that it's parents because with parenting, uh, and it's why uh, I chose to focus a good amount of my practice with parents. Uh, I work in various other ways too, but the is because that's where our instinct, our gut intelligence will hang in there longer than almost anywhere else because we just love our kids so much. We are so protective of them. We want to provide for them. And so when I suggest to parents that um, this is a cumulative, under-the-radar stress, they um, I'm essentially giving voice to an instinct that you mentioned right when we first started talking, actually, is that something is wrong, something is up, we never had to cope with anywhere near this pace of life when most of us were kids. We just didn't have to cope with this. The um, I'll give you an example. I was doing an interview um, uh, down at uh, for Time magazine not long after the Simplicity Parenting book was published with an award-winning journalist, lovely woman, uh, mother of three kids. And it was about hyper-parenting. It was a whole article was about the then the emerging term of helicopter parenting. And she was interviewing me um, for what was to become, interestingly enough, their cover, the, the, the cover um, of, you know, time and their cover story. Uh, because I was talking to her and she wanted essentially for me to back up this whole thing about, yeah, we're all helicopter parenting and how destructive that is. And I said to her, you know, we as parents can beat ourselves up perfectly well without a very well-known fancy magazine helping us do that. 
you know, my, I put, I said to her, look, you've got kids, I've got kids. When is a time when you hover over them, like helicopter, right? Hovering. So when, when is a time when you hover over your kids? And she said, well, I try not to. And I said, yeah, but there's probably a time you do. And then she, she got it. She said, yeah, when they're, when they're sick, I sit with them. I don't go very far. If they've got a real high fever, I hang in there. And I say, exactly. So do I. So do other tens of thousands of other parents around the world, millions of parents. We hover when our kids have got a fever because it's worrying and we don't know where it's going to go. I said to her that what I think is going on is that our kids have got a fever, only it's a soul fever. It's an emotional fever. Our families are fevered and our kids are fevered because of the pace of life. Their, their social and emotional immunity has been overwhelmed. Not their body immunity, but their, but their resiliency, their emotional resiliency has been overwhelmed, has been flooded, and they are fevered. And millions of parents now are hovering over their kids because their instinct tells them, this is not right, my kid's not well. So that therefore, the, if, we, if we can understand that the, the juxtaposition between a physical fever and a soul fever, like when our kids have got a physical fever, we dial back, we, we pull the curtains, we, we simplify their food, we quieten things down, we keep them home from school, we just, we just we simplify it. And that is exactly the same thing that many parents have an instinct to do with their kids' emotional and social, or what I call soul fevers. It's an instinctual gut thing. And I said to this interviewer, so therefore, helicopter parenting, in a sense, you could argue that, that anyone who was doing that, their instincts are still alive and still strong. And that's good. It's not bad. It's nothing we should make fun of and panic about, but it's something that we have to then move on. Because imagine with our kid with a physical fever, if we hovered really close and were sort of worried about them and stayed very close night, like two, three nights in a row, we're already exhausted, right? But we are in that hovering pattern with our kids with an emotional fever, sometimes for years, and that's where Simplicity Parenting offered for hundreds of thousands of parents, because this book has now you know, been translated into 31 languages, has sold hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of copies. And it's a simple little book. Well, it'd be ironic if it was complicated, right? Um, <laughs> is, is that um, is it offers a way for us to move on from hovering, because if we simplify and balance our kids' lives, then we don't need to have that stressful, something is not right with what's going on for our kids. It actually provides uh, not, not an answer. Uh, that's a bit cliched that it provides an answer. It provides movement. It provides a way of moving on from this feeling of slight anxiety about the way in which um, we're being asked to live. I love the way you described a more compassionate view of, say, helicopter parenting, because I, that, that, I think removing the judgment from it, I think, is so important in, in creating a space for dialogue. I mean, I, I always tell people, and I try to live this myself, is that, you know, people are doing things. If you, if you look at the world from the point of view where everybody's doing things for reasons that make sense to them. And they might not make sense on even on a conscious level. Maybe it's a subconscious level. It really fosters curiosity, I think, and really wanting to understand, you know, why is it that this particular thing makes sense to them? So I, I love that. I just love the way you describe your way of looking at helicopter parenting, because what it does is it, it says, you know, and I think it establishes something that's absolutely true, that we all want the best for our kids. It, it really does. And, you know, back to this, back to this quirk, gift, disorder spectrum, the, um, to, this is where this comes into it, because if parents 
start to dial it back, start to give kids more time to decompress, start to really question the new normal of clubs and play dates. You know, like, I don't know about you, Jason, but I never had a play date in my life. And and I think I'm okay. You know, I think I survived. <laughs> Did you survive without play dates? I mean, it's just a, it's a, um, if we, if we start to dial back, uh, what happens is that the is that the problematic behaviors start to become more reachable, malleable, softer. I mean, kids are kids; they're still going to sort of mess us around from time to time. But it doesn't. The repair that's needed becomes repairable. It doesn't then. Uh, necessarily need to involve a bunch of, you know, like us as mental health folk or what happens is that, let's say, for example, a child's quirk is that they are, um, they're very, they're very on to other people's strengths and weaknesses. They've got this kind of radar. They can sense, they can sense vulnerabilities and they can sense strengths and they know that. Now, you add cumulative stress to that child's life and the amygdala, the, um, the adrenaline and cortisol starts, starts pumping and the survival instinct starts pumping, then that child who can see vulnerabilities and strengths in others starts to only see vulnerabilities. And that child will become socially aggressive, over-controlling and even a bully. When you, because what they're doing is that the the their the, the the brain is saying to them, when you see weakness, like when you see weakness around you, that is a threat to your survival. Cut them out and cut them down, and and don't have vulnerable people around you when you're trying to survive, because that's what the, the amygdala hijack, as Daniel Goleman from UMass calls it. Um, is it's an amygdala hijack. The amygdala is overriding other more empathetic, sensitive parts of the brain. And so a child who can sense strengths and vulnerabilities, and that's just this, they're emotionally very switched on. These are the kids who can become bullies. And I've worked with, I want to say thousands of them, but countless numbers, because I work with schools with, with a social inclusion program that I teach all, all around the world, working with kids who, who need a lot of support socially. So I've had a lot of children, um, you know, uh, pass, pass by my work over the years. Now, that very same child, and I've seen this over and over, if they're, when parents bring a child or a, or, a, or a faculty teacher brings a child to my attention who's bullying, who's, and I, I think of bullying as hyper-controlling behavior. I don't use the word bullying much apart from just to use the vernacular. But a child who is so-called bullying or hyper-controlling their environment, the question's got to be, why are they controlling their environment? Why are they doing that? And by looking at that, and by saying, okay, very often simplifying and balancing their life, just dialing it back, quietening it down, so the amygdala can stand down, the fight or flight, freeze or flock brain can stand down. They actually move back, not just to being quirky, but the very same kid who's a so-called bully can often be the protector of the weak. Uh, because now their, their emotional insight when they feel safe and not at threat, because life has pounded on them so much, they've gone into a threat response mode. When life is not threatening them through low-grade, moderate, unrelenting stress, these, the gift of this, these kids is that they're leaders. They're strong. They'll help other kids who are weaker because they sense emotional vulnerabilities, but now they want to help, whereas previously... They wanted to hurt. And that's, I've seen this happen over and over. And so many teachers have seen this happen as well. 
it's for me, it's very hopeful, even thrilling, that you can take a child who is obsessive compulsive, who is um, hyper controlling or bullying, who is opposition defiant disordered, and all these you know, ODD, PDD, ODD, ADD. There's no shortage of Ds. You know, there's lots and lots of things mm-hmm. available. Um, but when you balance and simplify their lives, the gift of that starts to step forward. You see, Jason, I'm not suggesting there are not mental illness challenges, that we all have possibilities for physical illness, mental illness. What I am suggesting is that that quirk can become a gift if we give children a childhood and if we give families space to be a family. That's beautiful. One thing that I am curious about, and before we get into the pillars of simplicity parenting, so in order to, you know, start bring simplicity parenting into uh, your family, the parents themselves obviously have to change along with their child. And I'm curious, what, as parents go down this path, what benefits do they see in their own lives, like kind of independent of, of the changes or benefits that their kids see? Yeah, that's that's a focus actually of my next book. Funny enough, the next book, uh, the t- the title I think describes it. It's called "Being at Your Best When Your Kids Are at Their Worst," and that's um, that's the book title. But it also is it. This ki- comes up and uh, uh, came up and still continues to come up with many many parents that I work with and that. Our coaches, we have approaching a thousand coaches, simplicity parenting coaches in the world now. We train coaches. It's a simple little program because, well, again, it would be ironic if it was complicated. And, but the, um, and we have this amazing grassroots movement everywhere from Asia. I'm just about next month to follow up some group leaders in Jakarta and in uh, Ho Chi Minh City and in Mongolia as much as New York City. I mean, they're all over the world and so the feedback we get is very cross-cultural and it is um uh, uh, quite widespread having so many coaches out there in the world and what we get is that when when a, see as parents we'll do anything for our kids almost anything and if we understand that by simplifying and balancing out our family life, that that might be good for our kids. It might be good for their academic learning, which it most certainly is. A lot of parents notice this, that as soon as they get their lives regulated, <clears throat> the children's learning leaps. The, um, they're better with their siblings. They are better connected with their parents, better attached, better connected. When when that happens, you know, when there's the possibility that a, even a small amount of that might um, come to be, the effect on our lives as parents is is likewise very securing, very settling. I can't tell you how many parents over the years have said our relationship improved dramatically, or somewhat. Or my work life, this is a very common comment, my work life really improved, which is weird because I, I wasn't working so many hours, but because I, they were, the whole situation at home was calmer, I felt calmer, my kids were in a better shape. The creativity that I could bring to my business or my workplace was noticeably better. Our, our lives, particularly as couples, if you're in a relationship, a two, two-parent relationship, you become more connected, closer. Our, our intimate life becomes uh, stronger. Our being on the same page with our kids becomes connected. All these things are strongly interconnected. And we've had so many parents over so many years, because it's getting on 15 years now, uh, report that their relationships improved and their productivity and the way of being in the world shifted. And that for me is just, you know, it keeps you getting up in the morning, right? (laughs) That's that's a a wonderful thing. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I think I want to become a simplicity parenting coach. So that's exciting. I didn't even know it was a thing. So uh, thank, thank you for that. 
one one thing I wanted to ask you I, before we get into the four pillars, because I keep coming up with new questions, but is as you sort of make this change, like we talked about, you know, the amygdala and the cumulative stress, how important a skill is being able to effectively validate your child's emotions as you go through and you make this change? Because what I can imagine happening is kids are stressed. Uh, they might, you know, ex- you know, they might manifest like emotional dysregulation or whatever. And a lot of times what we do as parents is we try to correct those, we try to like, quote, correct those emotions or tell them that they're wrong. And what I've really been fascinated with lately is really the power of validating those emotions and that it's not agreement and it's not approval, but it's acknowledgement that your experience is yours and it's real to you. So what are your thoughts on validation and how it plays a role in maybe transitioning from our current lifestyle to a more, you know, simplicity parenting oriented lifestyle? You know, when you've got more space in your life, then and you slow things down a bit, not dramatically. You don't have doesn't have to be weird. You know, you don't have to move. You know, just you know, some northern, you know, remote outpost. In fact, I was there recently. Don't bother. Same issues. You know, um, <laughs> is is that when you um, have more space in your life, you don't have to, in a sense, tamp down dysregulation. You, you, you. Often, the reason we say to our kids, "It's okay, it's fine," or "Come on, that's you know, like, come on, guys, come on, we've got to go, we've got to go," is is that there's this there's this base beat of of move on, move on, got to keep moving, got to keep moving. So when the, whenever anything emotional comes up or anything that's that you know we might call dysregulated comes up, but it's just a kid being I, I think of as disoriented. I simply don't believe in disobedience. I've never met a willfully disobedient kid in my life, and I've met some right rascals. Um, I've only ever met a disoriented kid, and that's the whole theme of my Soul of Discipline book: is is that of not disorientation, not disobedience, but disorientation. When life just drops back a gear, just even a little bit. Then when things come up and our kids aren't doing so well, we don't have to feel we've got to move them on. And in a sense, uh, in doing that, bring a, up a feeling of mistrust in their own experiences. I'll give an example. A little while ago, um, well, quite a while ago now, because my kids are 15 and 18. Um, but I was when one of my daughters was uh, younger, we were in an emergency room. And there was a little boy there who we were sitting right next to him and his mum, and he was he was really screaming. He was very very upset, but but more than just a bit upset. It was it was troubling uh, to hear how how his screams were coming from a very very deep place. And the mum was saying to him repeatedly, "It's okay, it's okay. Come on now, it's okay." And she was getting frustrated. We'd been there a long time as, you know, emergency room, right? And so I, I, I chatted to the mum and I said, Would you, do you mind if I said something to your little guy? Because he was talking to my daughter and we'd struck up a, just a friendly sort of chat. And she said, oh, please do. And I, I, I said to him, you know, it really was scary when they, when they put that needle in your arm and you saw blood come out of your arm. And that really hurt. I bet you that hurt. And his, his sobs deepened a little bit, sort of just he started coming back into himself. And what he said, as I assured him that his feelings were fine, that he, he said, well, is there any more blood in me? See, he was it's a little boy. He was three, four years old. He was worried about there was no blood left in him. And I said to him, you know what? I think there's lots of blood left in you. But that's a big worry to have, isn't it? A very big worry. And my daughter at the time said, yes, Daddy, I'd be worried too. Do I have to? And so I got the kids talking and we were just talking. And then uh, the mum had told me that he was going to need a tetanus shot, like like one of the really owie, hurty shots. Mm. And I said to him, and you know what? There's another shot coming. And he said, I know. And are they going to take more blood? And I said, no, they're going to put medicine in your arm, love. But, and it's going to hurt as well, but 
after it finishes hurting quite quickly, you'll have a band-aid put on your arm, you'll go home with your mama, you'll have some nice food. And he asked, well, could they have macaroni and cheese? You know, it was just, you know, and then... I, 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 the nurse came near and she overheard this because we we're sitting right in the front row. And I looked up at the nurse and I said, could we go and see the room um, where Anthony is going to get his, his shot? And she said, oh, of course. And so we went and looked at the room and he got to, yeah, and, and so the story goes. And he got the shot right there and then, and it didn't, he didn't howl actually after that. And as he was um, going out with his mum, who was pretty fraught, um, you know, she was really shaken up with the experience. He was actually um, trying to trying to sort of um, calm her. He was saying, "It's okay, Mum. Um, it's okay. You'll be fine. We'll go home and we'll have macaroni and cheese." It was so funny. The nurse looked at me and just smiled as well. That now the boy was regulated and he was trying to help his mum. That example for me is really it's a it's a funny little thing. Really, it's no big deal. But that little boy needed assuring that what he was experiencing was real. And more than that, that the adults around him could moor their emotional canoe right alongside his emotional canoe. And that we were present and we were real. And we were not trying to tell him that his feelings didn't weren't, weren't real. And I more and more in, in Western society where we are somewhat conflict aversive on one hand and then we're moving fast on the other, we're at our best when we allow a child to have space so that we can come alongside them and that he or she gets the message, I can trust my feelings and I can trust my mum and my dad or, or, or whoever it is, the, the primary caregivers around a child, I can trust them to know what I'm experiencing. That is, a, that is a huge piece of attachment that gets made when we do that. That's a wonderful example. And I, I talk to people a lot, like the, the ability to be able to, you know, it's almost, uh, I heard it, I've heard validation described as uh, expressed empathy. And uh, it's just a, such an important skill in all our relationships and in, in establishing trust and, and effective communication. So thank you very much for that example. Now on to the meat and potatoes, uh, if we haven't done that already. But so can you can you tell us about the four pillars of simplicity parenting? You know, it's become known as these four pillars and become sort of kind of famous. Uh, these, there are these four pillars, but really these weren't invented. They they emerged. Um, over over long, long years of practice by myself and many others, it, we basically were looking for patterns. So what these are, these pillars, are four ways that we, uh, as, as Simplicity Parenting coaches, have noticed are both, if you make these shifts, these four shifts, or any one of these four shifts, the change is, is doable uh, enduring and organic, meaning it can exist in your family without feeling weird. Like, you know, if you've got a 13 year old daughter, she'd roll her eyes. Maybe if this wasn't organic and say oh, to a sister, it's okay. She's read another parenting book, you know, she'll, she'll get over it. Let's just ignore her, you know, cause that's, that's not okay. This has to be feel natural, feel just organic. So the four pillars we noticed were, the first one, and I put this, I put this as number one because it often seems the most doable, is simplifying the environment, just simplifying the number of toys, books, clothes, the smells of harsh cleaning fluid, fluorescent lighting, just the environment. But 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 crucially, understanding the power of less in the environment, less toys, less books less clothes and dialing them all the way back. And it's really interesting. Like for example, if parents, and we've heard this over and over, if parents dial back the amount of toys, right? Cause the average kid in the United States at least has around about 150 to 170 toys each. And that means the 3000 piece Lego set counts as one, right? Um, wow. When parents do this, and if you've got two or three kids, You've, you've now got 
you know, three, four, five hundred toys in a home. It's it's overwhelming. And so, you know, and I started to count this because uh, way back in my career, I would offer parents, uh, you know, standard family counseling, whatever coaching, or I would visit their home from wake up time to bedtime uh, over a series of three or four visits of two hour blocks. And, you know, very, I became known, by the way, Jason, as Dr. Trashbag. That was my nickname because I would have, I would have these big industrial trash bags with me because many parents, when I'd mention a toys, cull, clothes, books, they'd say yes. And one parent was usually gleeful and another parent was usually ashen, you know, the pack rack, pack rat was ashen. But the we go into the kids' bedrooms and we just start putting in all the annoying toys, the ones that the unrelenting gifting in-laws gave, all the, the naughty uncle toys that shoot stuff out. It's just all these toys that are broken, are plastic. Uh, and this is not, you know, Montessori, Waldorf or whatever. This is, I work in many, like in all kinds of environments. But parents realize that these merchandising stuff, these things, they're just junk. And they get they get put into the into the trash bag and and then another one and then finally with the toys it's fascinating to me across all the world across all educational sectors the toys that parents keep are the simple ones are the ones like you know my kid's favorite toy for years was the refrigerator with the box the refrigerator came in right because it, it could become a rocket ship it could become a an office it could become you know so many different things this gigantic box it wasn't all the expensive toys it was the things that were simple now the really interesting thing about simple and few toys is that when we have fewer toys the comment that we've heard as a real pattern is how well the kids start to play together and parents think well, hang on, that is so weird. How can they be playing nicely together if there's fewer toys? Wouldn't they fight over them? Now, leaning back into the brain science of this, actually, no. When you've got creative toys where you have to, you have to create something as opposed to the toy doing it for you. So you have to inwardly move yourself to make that box be a, a, a rocket or a car or a store or whatever it is, then you're stimulating, as you know, Jason, you're stimulating the limbic system of the brain, this creative system in the brain. You stimulate the limbic system, you're also stimulating cooperation. So you give simpler and fewer toys, it will bring about creativity and cooperation. That's a pattern we've seen in tens of thousands of homes. So that's the first, that's often the first kind of parents feel that's very doable and they feel great when they, when they have this toy, clothes, books, cull. Um, again, like books, for me, give kids fewer books because what is rare is precious. I don't know why we think giving kids a hundred books is going to make books precious. It doesn't. Giving children, having like a book library, a toy library, having five or six books out, 10 or 12 toys, and then the rest go, the ones that are keepers, go away in some boxes. And then every couple of months, a few new ones cycle in and a few you know old ones go out. That allows a child to deeply sink into a book, really go into it, as opposed to skim it as opposed or, or as opposed to turning books into construction material so that's the first pillar um i just wanted to uh, i just wanted to echo that point because for for us our kids in the backyard for example for years the only thing they had in the backyard was a rope hanging from a 25 probably a 25 foot tree uh and then a block of wood he uses a swing uh and it, 
after that, after a few years, we got him a trampoline as well. But those are really the only two things that have ever been in the backyard. <laughs> we just will stand there and watch what they manage to come up with, just with these the simplest things, you know, just in our mouths hanging open and how how creative they can be with the minimal amount of raw material. But they're using the most important raw material, which is their own imagination. Right, and that's and you actually you know point to something there is that um, the kids uh, when you give them fewer toys they then start interacting more with the natural world and they start pulling things out of the garden or from down the creek or wherever and they start constructing and building and then they're engaged much much more in the natural world which is you know that's just so important so the second pillar um the the second pillar is uh, what we also noticed is that families that have a strong relationship to rhythm and predictability have an increased sense of safety and security for their kids because little kids right through to, you know, uh, elementary and high school age kids thrive on rhythm. Rhythm settles things down back to the amygdala. It settles the amygdala down it not only stimulates the limbic system, but actually uh, allows the frontal lobes with this all-important uh, empathy, new learning. It allows the, the frontal lobes to be able to start to myelinate, to start to build capacities. And when you have this rhythmical, predictable life, you then have a child who has an inner roadmap that this is what we do and when we do it. I don't mean old, boring routines. Uh, this is not routine. This is warm, and it's rhythmical. It's things we do with kids. It's meal times, and this is how we do it. And all the little mini rituals around setting the table or preparing the food, um, setting the table, eating together, clearing away, and then going from there to a little bit of free time, and then very rhythmical. The free time is rhythmical, predictable, and then the, the bath time or going out if it's young kids, um, then then bedtime, bath time, bedtime, stories, and so on. It all becomes rhythmical, predictable. And what we noticed is over the years, and I've certainly noticed this with my own family, is that out of the we do, here's how we do it. We do this, we do that. It's almost like scaffolding. And as kids grow older, because as I mentioned, I have you know an 18-year-old now, out of the we do arises the I am. In other words, as a kid has this rhythm and this inner road, this, this roadmap that, that comes from their parents, they internalize that roadmap. And as they grow older, and now they're 16, 17, 18, 19 years old, the I am emerges from the foundation. It's built on the foundation of we do. So now I watch my daughter, and I'm not a perfect parent. I mean, claiming that should come with a, like a health warning on cigarette packages. But the, um, and I'm not. But I, what I watch her do now is that she, for example, in her first year of college, is has a an ability to be very rhythmical about her assignments, about her homework. She's actually internalized rhythm. And she's built her own structure now. The scaffolding, our scaffolding, is, is is taken away. It's just her and the world now. We're there to some extent, but not like when she was little, of course. And now she's doing okay. You know, she's doing all right. And in a subject that she's not doing okay in, then she knows how to how to structure her own inner life. So out of the 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 the, the, the outer form that we gave her has now been basically assimilated and becomes her own inner form. And that's the beauty of rhythm. It really secures kids, but it enables them to be able to do it for themselves as they grow older. Wonderful. That's, uh, that's so powerful because I think, I mean, obviously today, there's there's very little rhythm and it's very chaotic and every day looks different and I I feel like it makes kids feel unmoored and ungrounded so uh, I can certainly relate to that and that's something we try to do too we even we even uh, one of the one of the things we've established lately is like a monthly uh, family meeting 
And just so the kids know, you know, it's a time for us to come together as a family. My 13-year-old basically could not be rolling her eyes any harder at this. But, I, you know, we always explain that, you know, this is why it's important to us and we're going to do it anyways. And you'll appreciate it when you're older. And when we come in your house and we see you doing it with your kids, we will not say anything. We'll just be happy. So, uh, <laughs> so needless to say, she's uh, not receiving the message right now. But I, but I understand what you're saying. And I think it's, it's really important to establish those rhythms. So uh, I think the next one is to schedule a break in the schedule. Is that right? Yeah, the third pillar that, that we noticed was parents who were on to this, this whole principle of keeping their kids' schedules um, dialed back. We noticed that when parents dialed back, like soccer on Monday, ballet on Tuesday, music lessons on Thursday, soccer again on Friday, and then psychotherapy on Saturday to cope with it all, you know, it's like when parents started dialing back the scheduling the, and, and allowing the kids more downtime, more decompression time, a lot improved in terms of the connection that they felt with their kids in terms of their kids' academic abilities, social um, re relaxation and abilities. And one of the things I write about in the Simplicity Parenting book is, is to give the kids the gift of boredom. Just allow them to be bored. You know, if they come and they say something to you like, like, Dad, there's nothing to do, and the little one says, yeah. Um, and my response to dad, there's nothing to do is, oh, dear. Th that's it, by the way. It's just, oh, oh, gosh. Oh, dear. And <laughs> you gotta, you got to outbore the boredom, right? you got to be more boring than their boredom. And then off they go uh, with an eye roll, right? But off they go. And within 20 or 30 minutes, intense creativity breaks out. If we resist putting a screen in front of them, an iPad, a phone, a computer, turning on the TV, if we just allow them to be bored, if we resist edutaining them and come up with all these suggestions about what they could possibly do, just let them be bored. Because boredom is the precursor to creativity, just like frustration is the precursor to learning. Boredom is the, is, it precedes creativity. And then, boom, off it goes. And that rope swing in the backyard or that fort that they were building or on a rainy day or a snowy day, the game that they were constructing and making, let kids be bored. It's really, really okay that they do that because out of boredom, not only comes creativity, but comes innovation, comes adaptability, um, and come, and also what comes out of boredom is grit. Uh, this, this okay, we, we tried to do something, it didn't work. And then we tried to create this fort and it didn't work, it fell down. And then we, and, and this getting back in to the saddle, so to speak, and, and figuring out and problem solving. And, you know, Jason, one of the things I was struck by just uh, 18 months ago was here in the U.S., uh, figures were released uh, by the Trade Department that just over 32% of all millennials right now, people under the age of 30, are self-employed, freelance, um, or part-time or project-based, right? Non-benefited jobs, jobs where they were doing it for themselves. I did the math from 2005 to 2000, late 2015, right through... Um, one of the things that really struck me was a um, some data released by the, the um, Trade Department here in the United States, that, and it really related to scheduling because what it said was that um, just over 32% of all millennials, people under the age of 30, were now self-employed. They were freelance, um, project-based, uh, part-time, multiple part-time jobs, and I did the math from 2005 to late 2015 to 2025, and we'll be over 50% of the workforce will be self-employed. Now, if you ask any person, what are the keys to being successful to be, you know, in order to be self-employed apart from crazy, you know, but the, um, but what are the real skills? They'll, t they'll tell you about creativity. You've got to be really creative. You've got to be highly adaptable. 
You got to do, be able to move with things, not just stay on your rigid path. You got to be very innovative. You've got to get there and 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 get there first if you can. At most of all, the word that comes up over and over is grit, determination, and grit. Being willing to fail, being willing to problem solve, fix it, move on. Now, honestly, Jason, where did these skills come from? They don't magic themselves up overnight. They come from giving kids time to play. They come from all those parts of the brain, all those aspects that we just mentioned, creativity, innovativeness, adaptability, grit. They all myelinate. They all um, get their health for life when kids are little and we give them time to be bored we give them time to play. We give them time to problem solve. That stuff takes time. That stuff is unscheduled. We have to pull back the schedules so that they have unstructured free play time. And this is, for me, one of the key things is that simplicity parenting is not about going back into the past, into some uh, utopia that probably never existed anyway, and you know, back to Little House on the Prairie or something. It's not that at all. It's not sort of trying to hold kids back. It's actually raising kids to be successful in the future. That's that for me is the key, <clears throat> and that's what keeps me uh, keeping my life uh, simple and my family's life simple and balanced is because. I know now that with seeing my kids grow up and become now young adults, that they are they are able to do this more project based work. They're able to do more of this part time freelance stuff because that's the way the world's going, and that's why we need to pull back on the schedules to give kids that unscheduled free play time that will set them up for the future. I think that's so so important, and yeah, I uh, we're doing, but we're doing that with our, which we're trying to do that with our kids too. So it's nice to have some reinforcement. And I wanted to say too that of all time, my Little House in the Prairie is actually my favorite show. <laughs> so not that I want to go back there. I certainly would. They had their share of hardships. I wouldn't want to live in that time either. But it is my favorite show. So uh, and uh, so on to the uh, final pillar of simplicity parenting yeah this is the toughest one i think it's the toughest one some parents say to me they challenge that and they say you know no that wasn't so tough and that's becoming aware of digital screen media phones ipads tvs computers the, um and becoming aware of the amount of adult conversation around kids the f the fourth pillar in the book i call filtering out adult information Let's let's begin with just the amount of, of adult conversation that kids hear. Yeah, and we've kind of, as a Western society, lost track of what's appropriate to say in front of a little child and what's just simply should be deferred. I ask myself four simple questions, and myself and Catherine, my wife, have done this for years before we say anything in front of our kids. And that's number one, is it true? Oh, okay, but number two, um, will is is it is it necessary? Is it really necessary? I say this. Number three, is it kind, or am I just you know sounding off again? And then number four, is it will it help them feel secure? So is it kind, necessary? Is is it true? And will it help them feel secure? Unless it's unless the answer is yes, 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 and yes, four yeses, we just don't say it. We just simply don't say it. And we'll talk about it afterwards if we need to. But very often we've forgotten about it anyway. It wasn't it wasn't all that important. Kids are getting a lot of information from adults now, very unguarded conversations that they don't know what to do with. And frankly, it just makes them feel stressed. And we don't, no one means that. No one wakes up in the morning thinking, hmm, I wonder how I can have a bunch of conversations in front of my kids to make them feel stressed. I mean, no one, no one does that, but it's happening on a, on a mass level. And when we start pulling back that, we've done something good for our kids. The other part to that is that is technology. 
And in you know, recently we've run um, two uh, series. Actually, one in the past we did a series on digital decisions and trying to. This is in our on our website, simplicityparenting.com, and in the Simplicity community. Um, we we offered a, a workshop on that, and it's probably been the best attended workshop. I mean, there were just so many people on that workshop with so many deep questions about, well, this stuff is with us, you know, isn't it a reality in life? And for me, the the, the key to this is that I'm I am not anti-screen. That would be kind of weird in this day and age to be anti-screen or anti-anything really. But what I am is passionately pro-connection. And I'm passionately pro-connection to nature and the natural world for kids. I'm very pro-connection to allowing space and time for friendships and play, as we just, just, just as I just described. And then the third is that I'm very obviously passionately pro-family connection, building that safe harbor, that secure base for kids. And then the fourth, and perhaps the most important, is a connection to self for kids to know where they stand and not where you know all the advertisements are telling them to go they have a true north as opposed to the magnetic north of of pop culture now all four of those connections nature friends and play family and self take time it just it just takes time. And the average kid now in North America, 12-year-old, is watching seven and a half hours of screens per day. And that's excluding screen use in school time. So what I'm, what I'm saying here is that screens, you know, I've got worries about screens because we forget, we think they're so creative, but actually it's someone else's creativity. It's not... <laughs> Our kids' creativity. It's someone else's bo packaged, boxed up creativity that's being sent down a digital, uh, you know, a, a, a tunnel and packaged up with a whole bunch of merchandising and marketing that we seriously just don't need, particularly if it's getting in the way of connection. If I, I just can't compete as a parent. I can't, you know, uh, I, I can't easily compete. A family meal doesn't compete against an angry bird. Do you know what I mean? The angry yes. bird gates. It's yes. like, what if, if we can stand as sentinels over our kids' digital consumption and seriously know that this is a neural toxin, that this, and some parents ask me, you know, how much screens should my kids watch? And I, I answer rather pr provocatively, well, do you want a little bit of poison or a lot of poison? It's just the, the, the choice is yours. I can say stuff like this and leave town. But the um, <laughs> but it's, it, it is very, very challenging. And for me, the, the conversation orbits not around the screen itself, but anything that filters and gets in the way of those four connections that I mentioned has got to be acutely suspicious. I think that's really sage advice. You know, we have some relatives and so we don't, we have, like, our kids have screens, but we, uh, they're probably on them too much, but I think compared to their friends, not, not nearly as much, not that that, not that the comparison matters, but what's interesting is we don't like, they're not around at all at meals or anything like that. So I don't see, I don't interact with the kids on their screens that much, but it's interesting. We have some relatives and their way of life really is from the moment their kids get up, uh, they're on their iPads, you know, and it's, it's when you step, when you've stepped back from a little bit, like sometimes I think it's hard to see the forest through the trees when you're sort of, you know, you're in it all day long. But as we've, we've stepped back from it, and I, I give my wife most of the credit for this, honestly, you know, being part of Waldorf and her being uh, just a, a huge believer in that philosophy and of simplicity parenting. And uh, if it was up to me, we'd probably be living a pretty traditional life. So I, I give her so much credit for helping me see a better way. But when you're not exposed to it, 
and then you are exposed to it, it's incredible how jarring it is. And it's so clear how like the noises and the, you know, the, the hyperactive, you know, behavior when it comes to these games and there's just so much stimulation. It's so easy to see it when you manage to step away from a, a step away from it a little bit. Well, study after study after study now are pointing to um, the difficulty uh, in terms of uh, particularly around dopamine and around dopamine release uh, related to screens. Screens are designed to give us a dopamine release. And dopamine has got to do with, with pleasure and reward. And so if, if we have our kids become addicted to screens and now screen addiction, internet addiction is a formal diagnosis. There's, there's, there's no sort of uh, argument anymore that screens, that there's not a high probability that over screen use will lead to addiction because it works on just the same areas of the brain. It's, it's that, that, that whole debate is largely died down. Now we know that screens can be addictive. The, um, otherwise it wouldn't be a formal diagnosis available, you know, to, to psychologists, that's a slow and long process. But the, um, for me, the, 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 the rubber hits the road in a family is that if a child is really heavily uh, bathing, bathed in, in dopamine, which is what screens do again, then it's, it's so hard to say to, to, to your child, you know, hey, Johnny, it's time to clean up your room. We've got to, got to put out the trash. It's time to put the screen away and, uh, and set the table. There is nothing pleasurable about that. There is no reward. And if a child's brain is becoming wired because screen over screen use is, is changing the very structure of our children's brains. And we forget somehow, you know, we send in to navigate around that. And we say, you know, like, like kind of just close our eyes, uh, close our ears, shut down our hearing. And we just don't want to see it because we think, well, it's so ubiquitous. Everyone's doing it. Therefore it must be okay. But the dopamine addictive cycle makes it really hard to parent kids because then discipline becomes rough because there is not pleasure and reward in many of the things that we have to do to be together as a family. And the irony of this is that it's ma- not only is it making parenting really hard, we bought the device for them in the first place that's, that's giving ourselves such a hard time. Yeah, and I, I think that's really important because what we typically, what it seems to me like we're doing is we're 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 buying the 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 devices, the technology that's causing the problem in the first place, and then we're piling on intervention after intervention to try to correct the the implications or the results of using that technology. So it might be you know discipline, for example, it might be tutoring to help them in school, or it might be medication to help them, you know, try to cope with the, the, the issues that they're dealing with as a result of it, when the solution really is right before us. And that's to pull back, to start to, to start to go back to a more normal, uh, natural connected state of being. So that's a, I think that's a wonderful place to end it, Kim. And, um, Thank you. This is, I knew this would be good, but uh, this was uh, even better than I thought. So I really feel privileged to have had the, to have been able to have this conversation with you. And what is the best way for our guests to find out more about what you're doing? Our well, audience rather to find out more about what you're doing. Well, you know, there's the, the, the books that are out there and, you know, they're available in bookstores and, you know, online and so on. Uh, there's, but Essentially, there's there's this you know the normal stuff to, to simplicityparenting.com, and and most of all, in the core of that website, rather than just being a static website, there's a thing called the Simplicity Community, and that's the thing I'm most pleased with and proud of is that we're connecting parents all around the world. I do a weekly Simplicity Diary, speaking directly to parents about thoughts arising. I read my books, but update them with comments and stories. Um, we present workshops, free workshops within that community area as well. That for me is, the, is if someone wants to get support in making some early steps in simplifying, that's Simplicity 
community, which can be accessed through Simplicity Parenting, is is probably the, the thing that will help the most. That's wonderful. And we'll include links to that and to your books in the show notes page. So once again, on behalf of myself and the Mental Health Warriors audience and parents literally around the world, thank you for being a guest on the show. It's been wonderful. Oh, it's it's my pleasure, Jason. And I hope your wife listens into this because, um, yeah, you just sort of gave her a major pat in the back. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure to speak to you today. Thank you for the invitation. It's my pleasure. Thanks. And there you have it, a very different way of looking at parenting. But I think in having listened to this podcast and been a, an active participant in the conversation, it makes so much sense. And I think Kim's given you and he gave me so much to take away from this and ways to incorporate it into our own life and our own families to not only help our children, but to help ourselves. So I hope you got as much out of this as I did. That's what we're here at the Mental Health Warriors podcast to do. And we're never, ever going to stop until we assemble the most diverse and complete set of perspectives on emotional and mental health and well-being anywhere, period. And I'm going to end this podcast just like I end every single podcast. And that's by saying, if you're struggling, I want you to know that I have struggled too. And if you ever, ever want to talk to me, I will not judge you. And I implore you to recognize the power those eight words have to change somebody's life and for you to use them in the service of others and to realize that your story can be the source of your greatest contribution. So please tell it, tell it in the service of others. Until next time, my friends.